Okay, I think we'll make a start. So thank you very much, everybody, for um, coming along to the learning and sharing event delivered by the AHSN network. And this, the fourth of our events, is about reducing waste through innovation. Next slide, please, Danny. So we have a real mixed um, audience today. So we have uh, waste management staff, as you'd expect, state specialists, clinicians, sustainability leads, policy leads, management researchers. Um, we have people from, from Spain with us today. So it's a real wide range of people, not just from the NHS. And there's been huge interest in this, not just in the event today, but we will be recording the session so that people can um, watch it afterwards. And we've had a waiting list or an interest list of around 200 people. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, I mentioned we're recording the session. Um, with the heat, with, with IT these days, there might be some technical issues, and then inevitably are. we'll be working to resolve any as they occur. Uh, but this is on the, the Teams webinar function, which means you aren't on audio or visual, so we shouldn't get the, the thing where, where people are, um, there's background noise. Um, there's the chat function on the um, on the, the Teams webinar. Please do use this. There's so much value in sharing and learning from others on the call. Uh, we've seen so many relationships formed, so much good practice shared. So, so if you have queries, if you want to make comments, if you'd like to share information, please do put it in on the chat function. Next slide, please, Annie. So here's the um, agenda that the price of admission is listening to me to give a brief overview of the HSN network and what we're doing in this space. And then we'll get to the really interesting bulk of the session with information from Rebecca Griffiths from NHS England, Jason Mitchell from Newcastle upon Tyne Hospitals, Paul Broadbury from Vanguard Medical. Unfortunately, James Anderson has had to pull out at the last minute, but Paul has, has offered to do the slides, so we get the NHS perspective there as well. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Next slide, please, Annie. So the Academic Health Science Net Networks. We're a connected network of networks set up in 2013-14, and we have two main objectives. We support the innovation pipeline, so we help innovators understand what the NHS needs and develop their innovations to the point when they're market ready. And we promote the faster and wider spread of innovation into the NHS. And we do this to um, improve patient outcomes and create local economic growth. Each AHSN is embedded in its regional health and care community, as well as part of the national AHSN network. And clearly the heat has addled my brain because I haven't actually said who I am. So I'm Cathy Scott and I'm Deputy Chief of Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. So the AHSN network is a unique collaborative of expertise and experience. We share learning regionally, nationally and internationally. We pool intelligence to develop programmes around health and care needs and we benefit from a pipeline of emerging and proven solutions from around the country. Next slide, please, Annie. And what we do um, makes a difference. We, we, we support disruptive change uh, and we make a significant difference. So what we do saves lives. Our work on atrial fibrillation, which is abnormal heart rate that um, leads to strokes, very severe strokes, it meant that almost 12,000 strokes were avoided and more than 2,900 lives were saved. And this saved money. The um, atrial fibrillation work saved the NHS uh, £158 million and social care an estimated £105 million. We support economic growth. So in 21-22 alone, I work with innovators in industry, leveraged £455 million into local systems. We created 565 jobs and we safeguarded, probably more importantly, uh, a further 1,296. And we help people and their families. So in 21-22, 480,000 patients benefited from our national spread programmes. So our national programmes include Focus ADHD, which to date has supported over 19,000 children to receive an objective ADHD assessment, speeding up their time to diagnosis and making a significant difference to their lives and that of their families. And as a, a Personally, for us, the fact that children benefit and the families benefit from this quicker diagnosis is the main thing, but it's also saved uh, an estimated 6.5 million just from that work. So this is genuinely only a very small proportion of our work and our impact. So this slide only shows programmes, a small selection of programmes, where we've all worked together on the same thing, which is usually less than half of each AHSN's work. We work lo locally, we collaborate widely and we're successful because we're really adaptive and flexible. 
And we know that getting to net zero can't be done through incremental change, because although that plays its part, we need to do th things differently. And, and as you've just heard, this is what we do. Next slide, please, Annie. So because we make things happen, we change how healthcare is delivered. We support our NHS colleagues to change how their work how they work. And as a side benefit, this often benefits the environment too. So as an example, we worked with Trust in England to roll out um, evidence-based placental growth factor diagnostic tests. So these tests rule out preeclampsia in pregnant women, and it means that only those who definitely have the condition need to stay in hospital. Uh, this reduces the number of bed days needed and other associated consumables, which all impact on carbon emissions. And we estimate that we saved over a thousand tonnes of CO2 by implementing this in England. We've been supporting the rollout of virtual wards and virtual monitoring devices. So each AHSN has been working on virtual wards. So these innovations mean that people can be monitored from the comfort of their own home. And that uses special kit that can take readings. You can look in their eyes, ears, the back of the throat, and then you can send these results back to the clinician for review and appropriate treatment. And then this also reduces the need for face-to-face -face meetings and it reduces the need for travel. Uh, we also support innovation that reduces the amount of healthcare that people consume. So, for example, HN identifies those people with complex multimorbidities who are at risk of being high users of healthcare, and it provides health coaching to enable patients to manage their own conditions uh, better, and that reduces trips to the GP, to hospitals and other clinical settings, as well as reducing medication consumed. Next slide, please, Annie. So the programmes I've just mentioned all support environmental sustainability as a side benefit of the, of the innovation that we've delivered. So because we support innovation from idea to uptake, we can also identify and support innovations that have a direct impact on the environment. So, for example, we're supporting the Multicath research trial, and that's looking at whether um, being able to clean and reuse plastic catheters is safe. So if we were able to reuse plastic uh, PVC catheters, we'd reduce waste. So over 100 million catheters at the moment are thrown away every year in the UK. We've been supporting work around re reusable PPE, working with Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England colleagues. Through our accelerators and support for programmes like SBRI, we are working to identify potential innovations that impact um, on the environment in a positive way and support them to become market ready so they can be spread across England. And we're working with our industry and innovator partners to develop and test new tools and pathways that, for example, reduce emissions from asthma inhalers, which I'll touch on a bit in a moment. And we make sure that we signal the importance of this agenda to stimulate development of innovation with an environmental sustainability focus. So we support innovators to understand the impact of their innovation, working with them to explore how they can calculate and reduce the harm done to the environment. And we're building this assessment to be part of our business as usual activity. And finally, through events like this one, we're bringing people from the NHS, local authorities, voluntary community and social enterprises and wider to share and learn from each other's experience through these events, our blogs, articles, speaking slots and helping to build awareness and, and culture change. Next slide, please, Annie. Thank you. The HSN network is supporting systems to improve procurement and management of waste. So some of the, the innovations that we've been supporting in this space. So Automedi is a 3D printer. It uses sustainable plastic, which uh, I really like this. So you can choose from a catalogue the thing that you want to print. Once it's printed and you've used it and you have no use for it anymore, you can put it back into the 3D printer to be used to print something else. Um, Revolution Zero is displacing single use medical textiles. So it's making reusable masks, reusable um, uh, curtains and such like with more effective economic and sustainable alternatives. And binding science sciences, they, they work in the space of urinary management products, which doesn't really sound that exciting. But with the catheters that I've talked about, the waste is huge. So developing novel personal urinary management products that are environmentally sustainable can have a big impact. Next slide, please, Annie. So finally, um, we contribute, just to summarise, we contribute to net zero in four main areas through technology, services or products that specifically address the, this agenda as their primary focus. So I mentioned asthma earlier, where several AHSNs are supporting um, a programme called Sentinel, which works with AstraZeneca and Hull University Teaching Hospitals to deliver, uh, to identify those patients that are particularly high users of blue Sava inhalers, which are damaging to the environment, and um, identifying the users, changing their behaviour, because if you're using your inhaler too much, that's an indicator of problems to come. You're not managing your asthma. Identifying them, changing their behaviour, and where clinically appropriate, moving them onto dry powder inhalers. 
uh, which are much less harmful to the environment. And we transform pathways uh, with a side benefit of reducing emissions. We support our supply chain to be greener. And um, we improve understanding of what environmental sustainability in healthcare can look like, changing culture about services and how they should be delivered. And this is an area of work where we're particularly excited about and interested in, uh, and especially for companies and innovators where the actual understanding of this is not particularly high. So I hope that gave you um, an understanding of what the HSN network is doing in this space. Thank you very much for listening. And now I'd like to hand over to Rebecca. Thanks very much, Cathy. Uh, just give me a second to take control of the slides. Hopefully this works. Yes, it has. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Rebecca Griffiths and I work for the Net Zero and Sustainable Procurement team at NHS England. Um, we are positioned in quite an interesting um, way at NHS England because we are part funded by the Greener NHS programme, but we are also part funded by the Commercial Directorate. Um, so um, straddling across these two programmes means we're quite well positioned um, to deliver the work that we do. Just come to the next slide. And if I'm going between my two screens, I've just got some of my notes on my on my larger screen. And um, so to give you some of the background um, about what um, our programme does and what, what is the policy that underpins that. Um, so a lot of you who are attending today will have heard of the uh, NHS Net Zero report that was published in October 2020. And this is where the NHS really affirmed for the first time um, the, the need to take action on climate change. And we have committed to significant ambitious targets, reduction targets um, for our direct emissions to be net zero by 2040 and our indirect carbon footprint plus uh, emissions to be net zero by 2045. But something I guess that is maybe less known about our programme is the other work that we do. Um, so we're also committed to the transparency across the supply chain to eliminate modern slavery. Um, I think lots of people would have maybe seen, you know, this headline you can see on the slide here um, around uh, sourcing of PPE um, from companies um, across the globe that maybe had aspects of modern slavery in their supply chain. And that's something that we, we are committed to eliminating within in the NHS. And also um, to facilitate local economic growth um, in line with the social value policy. Um, so the, uh, the policy procurement notice that was issued in June 2020 um, by, by the government um, states a minimum weighting of 10% of, of social value across all tenders. And we've adopted this within the NHS. So in April 2022, we published the net zero and uh, uh, social value guidance, um, which calls for all tenders um, across the NHS. At the moment, it's for those in excess of £5 million but from um, in subsequent years that will extend to all new tenders need to have a minimum weighting of 10% value across um, social value but also uh, net zero carbon um, in order for um, suppliers to be able to supply to the NHS. In terms of our programme, well, we've I've obviously talked a little bit about the policy that underpins our programme, um, but really our purpose is that we are committed to make sure that every every pound the NHS spends on products and services is socially and environmentally responsible. Um, this is obviously underpinned by our net zero ambitions, um, but also our social value and modern slavery ambitions too. And the way we do this is through three individual work streams. Um, so we have our procurement practice work stream and they are really dedicated to supporting our procurement professionals across the NHS to make sure that net zero and social value principles are part of every tender, every purchasing decision across the NHS. We also have our supplier engagement work stream. Um, I think we have something like 80,000 suppliers in the NHS, which is huge, right? So we can't interface with those all individually. Um, but what we do do is uh, work with the supplier community through trade bodies, etc., cetera, um, to provide a consistent voice, um, but also a roadmap um, for suppliers to meet our ambitions. So there's lots of different pilots that are underway at the moment to kind of bring suppliers along on this journey with us, um, because we are probably the first customer um, and and a very big customer to a lot of our suppliers who are committing to these net zero targets. And last but not least, um, operational interventions. This is my work stream um, and this is what I'll be talking to you a little bit more about today. Um, so operational intervention is, is really the way that we can look at the demand side. So if we think about the NHS, what are we buying? Why are we buying? Is there ways that we can buy differently or less? Um, and so that's really a big behaviour change piece. Um, and lots of you are interested in this locally, um, in, in your own organisations, um, will understand that actually it takes quite a lot to change 
the way that people think um, in order to, to buy differently and buy more sustainably. So our, so our goal is to make sure that we can integrate sustainable and innovative practices across healthcare. And how do you do that? Well, it's uh, 80,000 suppliers, um, a lot of carbon, um, and in our, our approach to this, um, which is underpinned in the Net Zero report and has really formed sort of our, our programme for the next five years, is looking at three key intervention areas. Um, sorry if this is a little bit small and you can't see it, um, but this is looking at um, the key areas where there's lots of different work that is underpinned in each of these areas that will form the, the emissions targets that we're working towards as a programme over the next five years. So so for example, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, things like walking aids and device remanufacturing, which sit in the device reuse and refurbishment uh, intervention. We've also undertaken some work on reducing paper, um, so moving to fully recycled paper, um, but also um, using less virgin paper across the NHS. Um, and then as we build our programme, we'll be um, working across more of these intervention areas. And particularly, you know, what's of interest maybe from an HSM perspective is thinking about that process and product innovation. So how do we help you as the NHS uh, do that? I know we don't have just the NHS on the call today, but um, one of the ways that we are trying to support the NHS um, is trying to give clarity from the centre at NHS England so that the message is really clear about what we're asking to do um, and trying to pull everything together all in one place um, so that we're giving advice um, in terms of what the, what the benefits are and the return on investment. Um, also advice across things like infection prevention control, liability and risk. Um, and the idea is that actually we want to make it really easy easy for the NHS to navigate this information, regardless of what the project area is. Um, uh, you know, at the moment we've been working at may maybe that individual product level, um, but I guess the goal would be to kind of have that bigger picture approach to say, OK, if we're going to take any product that we want to look at, you know, without the, in the hundreds of thousands that sit on our on our NHS supply, chi supply chain catalogue, um, how can we approach um, being able to, to make that more sustainable? And so we do that in a few different ways. We've already talked about the strategy and our key intervention areas. Um, but one of the things that we've developed that we try to um, map our how to guides by is the five R's of sustainable procurement. Um, so they are reduced. So can we do without the product? A good example of this is um, the gloves reduction work that's been going on across across England to rationalise the use of gloves. Um, reuse. Um, can you buy reusable products instead of single use? You know, reusable PPE is a big top topic at the moment. Um, but there's also a lot more work being under, uh, undertaken around things like reusable surgical instruments. You know, moving away from that single use products. Um, reprocess. That's something that's going to be covered in a couple of presentations today. I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, and also Paul um, from Vanguard will talk about it. Um, so looking at products that maybe need to go through an enhanced process um, or approach that needs to take it through a more enhanced cleaning um, or checks, so that then it can be fit for purpose to be used as new again back into the back into the system. Um, renewable. So what is the product made of? Um, I mentioned paper. So, you know, losing using less virgin materials. So, for example, buying more recycled paper when when we need to use paper. And last but not least, um, recyclable um, is the product recyclable. We've done a lot of work on walking aids um, and our goal is to increase the reuse and refurbishment of walking aids. But when that walking aid needs to come to its end of life, that that aluminium can make sure that it's going into a recycle waste stream rather than going into any other kind of waste stream. So on to, I guess, that we're going just to give a bit of a flavour of some of our how-to guides. We've only um, shared a couple of slides from each, um, but we also will share some links afterwards. So if you'd like to sign up to our Future NHS Hub and access all of the products we've got available, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and you can also email my team as well. We're happy to answer questions. So starting with the device remanufacturing how-to guide. So this is some work that we've been undertaking since uh, about, about kind of autumn, winter last year. And we work quite closely with Paul, um, who's going to be um, talking in a little bit. Um, and the main, the main goal of this work is to look at where there are um, medical devices that are, they're durable, they're expensive, and there's already um, a process um, in place that can remanufacture these devices to make sure that they can come back into the NHS system. So um, 
at the moment we've been focusing particularly on uh, electrophysiology catheters um, and also harmonic scalpels or energy devices um, and we've been trying to work to spread the message of, of what companies like Vanguard do um, but also to support the wider NHS to look at well what are the barriers um, to introducing uh, remanufactured devices into NHS trusts what is that behaviour change piece and how as we as NHS England can we support that to make it easier for the wider NHS. Um, we demonstrate in the business case how there's there's lots of different benefits. So whether that's um, revenue and savings, so you know remanufactured products costing up to fifty percent less, or um, savings that you can gain back for the high high cost items. Uh, there's also I'm um, trying to build that confidence in clinicians that actually these are really safe um, and quality assured items to use. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that I think a lot of the time sometimes clinicians forget that actually these are the original devices that they purchased from an original equipment manufacturer and all they've done is gone through a process that that makes them fit for use um, for a second, third, fourth, fifth use. Um, and, I, and I think that's a key message that we try to reassure. And also it's an interesting point that actually every remanufactured device, I'm sure uh, Paul will uh, sing a lot about this, but is, is, you know, individually tested. Whereas if we think about original equipment manufacturers devices, they're only batch tested. So actually the safety is really, really high with these devices. Um, and of course, the carbon savings, savings that's obviously our, our kind of our, our main goal and ambition. Um, and last but not least, obviously the waste aspect. You know, the, the goal of this, this event today is to talk about waste and innovation. Um, and by creating that more circular economy, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, is trying to move from that linear cycle of using something once and then putting it in the bin or putting it in a waste stream. And so what we really want to do is promote materials and products to keep being used within the system for a much longer period, as long as it's safe and clinically you know, viable to do so, um, for a much longer period before they come to their end of life, uh, as opposed to it just being after single use. I'm just going to move to talk to a little bit about walking aids. So walking aids, a similar sort of approach. We have our how to guide. It's formatted in a very similar way where we've got the business case that's outlines the different uh, benefits and return on investment. Um, again, there's obviously monetary savings, albeit small. I think some of the pushback that we get about walking aids is all oh, these are low cost items, but actually we buy a lot of them. I mean, if you can see on this slide here, you know, 66 trusts in England in 2019 spent six, uh, sorry, spent 14 million pounds on 560,000 walking walking aids. And I think the average return rate at the moment is still only about 20%. Um, so we know we've got some fantastic work with over 100 NHS trusts with some sort of return or refurbishment scheme in place, but actually there's still a great opportunity to increase those return and reuse rates. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is work with um, the wider NHS. We've got uh, working groups. We do virtual drop-in sessions. Um, we are working with RAP um, during National Recycle Week into, in September, and we're trying to get the NHS to really ramp up um, and kickstart their return and reuse campaigns um, to save money, to save carbon. There's really significant carbon associated with walking aids, um, but also to increase that supply chain resilience. Um, and that's something actually I didn't quite mention when I talked about device remanufacturing, that one of the key parts of, of, of reusing these different devices and not buying new is actually that where there's been supply chain disruption for various different reasons, whether that's COVID, Suez Canal or other reasons, we've had trust feedback to us that actually sometimes this has led to delays in discharge because they haven't been able to prescribe a walking aid. And so actually, if we can boost that supply chain resilience, um, we're also making sure that this doesn't disrupt uh, patient care. Just moving on to my last slide, um, it's just to give you a bit of a flavour of what's coming up um, later this year. Um, so we've uh, already also produced a how-to guide in uh, in paper. Um, so we're trying to encourage um, all NHS organisations to switch to 100% recycled paper because actually there's still only, I think, is about 30 trusts, 30%, sorry, of trusts that are doing this. Um, NHS England made the switch themselves um, this year, so we are leading by example. Um, but later this year, we're going to be doing some work on reusable PPE, um, reusable clinical waste bins, and we're also going to be looking at catering plastics and um, trying to reduce that use of single use plastics across the NHS. I think that's mostly me. I think my next slide might be. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That was just a bit of a whistle to stop to an overview of our programme. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat um, and I can also um, you can also email our team and we can come back to you afterwards. But hopefully that's given you a bit of a steer of what what kind of the message and is coming down from NHS England from the centre to the wider NHS. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Um, over to Jason now. And as I said before, if you want to put your questions in the chat, we will pick them up at the end. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Mitchell. Uh, I'm the Waste Manager at Newcastle Hospitals. Um, my presentation today is just to, to highlight uh, the impact of innovation uh, on our sort of healthcare waste streams uh, and the positive uh, results that, that arise from that. Um, I would like to highlight that throughout this, uh, there are some recurring themes that kind of they, they go around in your head endlessly, you keep coming back to them. Um, uh, and I've just listed a few of them here. Um, the, the waste hierarchy is a really key and important uh, um, uh, measure for me. Uh, and it's it's, uh, it's something that sort of drives my, my, the work that I do. Um, but I do need to stress that zero waste does not mean, uh, and the, the, this presentation is about zero waste, that the zero waste does not mean that there is no waste at all, uh, rather that, the, rather that uh, the waste actually becomes a resource somewhere else within the system uh, and doesn't just go straight to disposal. Um, so there are, there are all kinds of thoughts around circular economy. Um, you, you will see throughout this that there's a role for energy from waste within this, and it's rather a big role. Uh, and that's a challenge for us to try and minimise that that that, that uh, and, to, and to try and move away from that uh, as we move away from from disposal altogether. Um, there's a challenge uh, with, for, for recycling and recyclable materials uh, within this. Uh, a lot of the plastics, for instance, that we generate within healthcare waste settings uh, are not easily recyclable plastics. They're not easy to identify, even the polymer content of those plastics, uh, and so there are challenges in there. Uh, and then a bit wider than this, there, there, are, there are thoughts around the, the metrics that we use within this. For instance, when we look at the waste hierarchy, which, which we'll come to fairly soon, how do we actually measure reuse? How do we measure minimisation and prevention of waste? Um, because those should be the biggest efforts, really, that, that go into the work that we do. Uh, and at the moment, you'll see that, as you'll see, there are more questions than answers for, for a lot of this. So that's the traditional model of the waste hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, disposal should be the, the, the least viable option uh, for, for our waste streams. And then you move up through the waste hierarchy um, through other recovery, which, which tends to cover energy from waste, but also can include composting or anaerobic digestion of food, um, up to recycling uh, and then reuse above that. And then eventually you, you should be at a stage where you're preventing waste to, to being generated in the first uh, instance. And, and the, the reason that triangle is inverted is that really the majority of the work should be happening in the higher uh, bands of the waste hierarchy uh, and really a minimum amounts or minimal amounts should be going on at the bottom of this. So that's one way of thinking about the waste hierarchy. Um, this is a, a, another way of sort of thinking about uh, waste and, and uh, the circular economy, if you like. If you take the left hand side of this model, basically it's it's a make use dispose model. We, we take raw materials out of the ground, we produce products, we use them, and then we throw them away. Uh, and historically, that's how we've always operated. Um, you, you could argue that maybe for the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a much stronger recycling ethic and really the reuse and the recycling uh, model uh, 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 aspect of this uh, in, in the middle there uh, highlights that. But there's still disposal, there's still a, a sort of a throwaway um, mentality that sits within this. Whereas in a true circular economy, uh, the raw materials that go into the system remain within the system endlessly and continue to be uh, to be used. This is how we chose to interpret this uh, in Newcastle uh, upon Tyne hospitals. Um, we we divide, developed our own uh, zero waste model. Uh, and I think um, there's a peculiarity really with, with healthcare in that some of our waste streams currently at the moment uh, almost led, are required and by legislation must go to the very bottom of the waste hierarchy to the disposal line. Um, but if you, if you take this as a model, uh, you'll see that uh, we, we, we want to move towards a circular economy um, and, and we, have, we have ways and means in which we're working towards that, which you'll see as we go through future slides. Uh, but just bear this model in mind. We return to it right at the end, just a reminder of, uh, of, of the direction that we want to go in. But, but I should highlight, just identify that underneath the zero waste vision for our hospitals, ultimately we want to dispose of nothing at all, not nothing. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to keep as much material within the circular economy as we possibly can. Um, there's an animation on this slide and I realised it this morning when I checked and I'm irritated by it because I should have taken it out. But this just gives you a flavour of the, uh, the typical hospital waste streams that we deal with. I won't bore you with the detail of these at all, but it just gives you a flavour of the, how we categorise and the colour codings that go behind a lot of the waste that we, uh, we generate. And every different colour coding means that, that something different must happen with that waste stream 
uh, compared with the others. Uh, and this gives you a flavour of how waste has actually uh, moved over the, the, the last few years for, for us. Going back to 2013-14, how we've increased the, the, the amount of waste that we managed to recycle. Um, but in particular, we've managed to uh, reduce the amount of waste that we classify as hazardous waste that needs to go to either heat treatment or go to disposal. And you'll see that from 2018-19 onwards, significant uh, moves were made in that direction. And hopefully you'll see through future slides that, uh, that we've continued to, to, to make trends in that area. This is just to prove to you that we don't just report on an annual basis. We actually do monitor this stuff on a monthly basis. Um, you know, uh, your, your, your green band is your recycling, your black band is general waste. Uh, the, the, the stripy yellow and black stripy band is what we call tiger waste. That's, that's non-infectious, non-hazardous clinical waste, uh, healthcare waste. Um, the orange band is waste that must be treated and is technically hazardous. And then the red band at the bottom is waste that must go to an incinerator. And that's where our sticking point is. That, that's, and you'll see that as, as we continue through. OK, so let's just talk about some of the waste hierarchy improvements uh, and the impacts of those that we've made over the last few years. So it goes back, it, it predates me, this one, the commitment of our trust to, to zero to landfill. And that started in 2011. Uh, my predecessor in my role made that, made that decision. Uh, it was driven largely by compliance, but also by reputation of the trust. Uh, it was seen that, the, that you know, the, the more waste that you keep away from landfill, there were cost savings associated with that. Um, and it's it clearly it's an improvement in your waste hierarchy and there's less carbon associated with uh, with with uh, not landfilling waste. And the impact that has on the waste hierarchy here is you take waste from the very bottom band. I, imagine if this was 2011, everything in that black band there would be what is currently red. You know that that's how big that band would be. But that's been taken out and it's been moved up through uh, the waste hierarchy. And it's 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 an energy from waste situation that we have for for those waste streams now, rather than sending it to a landfill site for disposal. We use are a big user in Newcastle. In fact, we were one of the first trusts in Europe to adopt Sharp Smart, the reusable Sharps containers. Uh, we've been using this product now for the best part of 20 years. Um, and the big the big impact for us here, firstly, is that it's a safety device. Um, you know, and, and we, we the, the instances of needle stick injuries are very small with this product uh, compared with other forms of disposal. Um, but also the associated environmental uh, benefits to this, a reduction in single use plastics. We're not using single use virgin plastic materials to dispose our needles into and then sending them to an incinerator. And it reduces ultimately our waste volumes. So the waste impact of, of, uh, of using Sharp Smart is that we just reduce and we throw away less material. Uh, we're a big user also of what we call bio bins. Uh, they're manufactured by a company called Econix. There, there are competitor products on the market as well. Um, this uh, this is, a, is a move away from single use plastics again and also less, less carbon associated with the incineration of this waste. But also a happy coincidence of this is that this waste is a non-hazardous waste stream and it doesn't have to go to a clinical waste incinerator. So the impact of that is, again, a move of waste away from the red band at the bottom, this incineration band, and towards energy from waste. Um, we converted, completed our conversion, probably be behind time really, we completed our conversion uh, of the hospitals to, uh, towards majority uh, non-infectious waste and minority uh, infectious waste. We completed that in 2019. Um, anyone within healthcare will be familiar with this, uh, this, this categorization of waste. The majority of patients that come through our hospitals do not have an infection, but historically we treated waste as if it was infectious. Um, we're, we're a bit smarter about that now, and most, most wards and departments will generate both waste streams, uh, but they'll be more acutely aware of which patients they're treating who have infection and the waste that needs to go to some form of treatment. And the impact of that is that we move that band of waste in the in the in the tiger band there moves out of, uh, out of the orange and into tiger. So taken together, you can see that there are there are impacts the, the the cumulative impacts, if you like, of these uh, these approaches and the, the, some of the innovation here. Just looking, what what this actually does for us though is it creates an interesting dilemma. Um, we 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 move away from waste that we categorise as hazardous, uh, and you can see that we've halved that over the years. Um, but but we st but what that does is it puts this it moves that waste really up into the energy recovery band and that's really not a place that we want to be in either and that's work that we'll have to address in the years to come as to how we actually move uh, move away from that. 
So the issue really is this this big bulge. I call it the bulge in the middle. It's the uh, the, the energy recovery uh, band of waste. Another way of looking at this, if you take the, the our our sort of uh, um, report here, is that approximately 97% of our waste, healthcare waste, stays within what we would say is a circular economy. But we have this stubborn amount at the bottom here, this waste that must go to an incinerator, about 3% of our waste that we can sign as a hospital, and that's the disposal level. So some recent ideas to, uh, to, to sort of encourage movements further. Uh, both, both of our main hospitals, the RVI and the Freeman Hospital, uh, have now got uh, ingenious bits of kit in, this thing that sits in the middle here. Uh, this silver machine, uh, and basically what's inside that machine is a centrifuge. It takes what is really quite wet food waste, spins that food waste off, and leaves us with a dry flake, um, which can go off to an anaerobic digesting facility. But what that does for us is that reduces the volume of our food waste that goes out by about 80%. It also means that we're not sending this stuff out via the sewer, uh, which is, a, I think, Northumbrian Water should be sending us an award for. Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, and the impact of that from a waste hierarchy is that we move waste from what would be considered to be black bag general waste into the recycling waste stream. Then we have some initiatives around sharps. I, I'm not going to explain the model on the right hand side, but, but you will see the impact of that in a moment. Uh, the, the, the product on the left is a product that takes a needle. You insert the needle in the top and six seconds later you take it out and you've got a needle that's been destroyed. Uh, that in theory, well, not in, in, sorry, in reality, actually increases the amount of needles you can dispose into a sharps box. So you need less sharps boxes. So you're reducing the amount of either disposable sharps boxes or reusable sharps boxes that you use. In theory, you could also reclassify that waste as uh, non-hazardous pharmaceutical waste because the needle, the sharp has been destroyed from this. Uh, we, we're, we're not at a stage where we've tested that yet, but that's the theory. Um, the model on the right, which I, I appreciate is very small, I'll summarise it for you. Um, it, working with Sharp Smart, our reusable Sharps um, uh, 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 supplier, um, they are taking the contents of Sharps boxes, putting it through a system where they shred that waste, put it through an autoclave process, which sterilises that waste. Uh, they capture the effluent from that, uh, and that effluent goes off to the incineration industry as a quench uh, for, for, for incinerator, to control incinerator temperatures. And what we're left with is a solid waste, which is effectively a refuse derived fuel and can go to an energy from waste facility. What we've done through that is we have avoided completely having to send sharps uh, through to a clinical waste incinerator. And the impact of that you will see on the next slide, because you can barely see the disposal line at the bottom of this, this line. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that in a, a little bit more detail uh, in, the, in the next slide or so. Um, but we've, uh, we've gone from an average of about 12 to 13 tonnes of incineration waste a month. The last two months of the first two months of this financial year, it's about six tonnes. I appreciate it's very small to, to, for you guys to see. And then there are further opportunities which we which we would like to explore. <clears throat> this is just one idea that's on the market uh, where hospitals may be able to set up their own uh, uh, bi biological treatment process, if you like, where you put waste in through black bag waste uh, and over the course of three days, that waste gets dried out significantly and the volume of the waste that you send off is then reduced significantly. And the impact of a, of a technology like this, for instance, would be a big reduction on the, the the black, the general waste band that you have in the middle there, and an overall reduction in your waste, uh, the waste that you're consigning. So this is the situated state of play at the moment. We've got about now 98.5% of healthcare waste from hospitals that we would say is not going through to a disposal route. And we're left with that stubborn still 1.5% of waste that has to. Uh, and I will highlight those now. Cytotoxics uh, must be must be high temperature uh, incineration. Cytotoxic waste originates from the treatment of patients with cancer. Uh, there are a lot of uh, quite quite uh, toxic drugs within that, and they must go to an incinerator. Until that's the regulations around that change, we're stuck with that. Um, uh, the red bucket waste here that can be placentas, that can be amputations, that can be anatomical waste, glass slides, can be all sorts of things. Must go to an incinerator. Um, highly infectious wastes in the middle here and the yellow bags must go to incinerator. Radioactive wastes must go to incinerator. Uh, and currently, GM wastes, if you don't have an on-site autoclave, genetically modified waste must go to incinerators. But these are almost like pleasant dilemmas to have because, you know, 
we've at a stroke we've almost halved the, uh, the 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 waste that we're sending through that disposal route um and these are the things to be working on and to talking to the regulators about over the coming years and then finally some of our outstanding challenges that that, that still are still quite evident we're still very reliant on energy from waste from this for this process um we uh, we have questions around how much actual dry mix recycling is actually recycled. Uh, you know there there are challenges around that and, and what our recyclers say they are doing to what they actually uh, to what they actually are doing. Um, government direction and regulation and some of the you know, one of the best things the government ever did was introduce the landfill tax, for instance. That that drove innovation and change uh, in the recycling industry. Um, but that's grown to a halt. And the, and where's where's the next idea? Well, what are we going to do next? Um, the, the appetite of industry for this, uh, there, there, there has been a move, especially with the big national waste companies towards energy from waste uh, and away from sort of uh, separation and recycling. Uh, the, the closure of the markets in China sort of uh, did, it didn't do much to help that, that, that process. But there are disruptors on the market. I think I think Paul, who's going to come on next, would classify what he does as maybe disruptive within within the, the market that he operates in. And certainly the needle smart product is a disruptor as well. Then we have questions around our definitions for reuse and minimization and prevention. What metrics do we use? Um, how do we get away from having the, these, these, these classifications of waste that require high temperature incineration? And then finally, the big elephant in the room in all of this is the role of our procurement colleagues in this. Uh, and how do we buy less stuff? And how do we buy better stuff? Because that is really, really important throughout all of this. And there's just a reminder of, uh, of the model and, and, and the direction that we're heading in. And I've probably spoken for far too long, um, but, uh, you know, what can you do about it? <laughs> Finish. Thank you, Jason. That has prov provoked a lot of, of questions that we can come to later. Um, Paul, over to you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Paul Broadbury. Uh, I'm the country manager for Vanguard. We're a medical remanufacturer. Uh, in essence, we take some of your previously deemed single use devices and, and turn them back into reusable, reusable products. Um, but uh, so the objective uh, for me of the next uh, next few slides is to provide you with a bit of an understanding uh, of what it is that we do um, and, and what it delivers in terms of sustainability and savings. And then for you uh, and uh, to maybe think about when to introduce this, uh, if, if, if what I say is of interest to you, uh, into your own trust's uh, remanufacturing, uh, sorry, into your own trust sustainability or savings work plan. Um, and again, I think I need to offer another thank you here because uh, there are 59 hospitals now across the UK uh, with our program embedded. Um, and that uh, is also uh, you know, has been contributed to by, by entities such as AHSN, uh, NHS England, et cetera, who've been uh, really helping us uh, along along the way. Um, by virtue of that, there may be some people on this this uh, this webinar who've already heard uh, me talk before um, and are already fairly versed in remanufacturing. Again, please please bear with, and I'm hoping there's still something good in here that you can you can take from uh, from from the presentation. Um, so just to whet your appetite before we go into too much detail, um, as I mentioned, there's 59 hospitals that we've been working with for for a while now. Uh, one of them is Leeds, um, and Leeds uh, have written a, a case study uh, highlighting some of the benefits uh, of remanufacturing. And there are two key facets to the program. One is the harvesting of your uh, of the single use devices that we look to remanufacture, and the second facet is actually using the remanufactured devices. Uh, Leeds General Infirmary and their cath labs are doing both, um, and you can see some of the numbers on the screen in front of you. Hopefully that uh, that they've generated through that. Uh, this is in calendar calendar 21, um, and uh, despite all things COVID, they still uh, divert 75. Uh, 0.3 kilos of advice that would have just been thrown away uh, came it came to us to be repurposed uh, we pay uh, a nominal amount for for the devices that we collect but they still earn 22,000 pounds plus for those those devices so there's a, no, a revenue stream here as well uh, they used 604 uh, remanufactured devices uh, across their clinical team uh, in the cath labs and that saved an estimated 76,610 pounds um, and we have a very detailed life cycle analysis that cites a 50.4 percent reduction uh, when you use remanufactured versus new so we could also quantify that there's over half a ton of co2 uh, saved as, uh, by, by that use as well um, and just down the road in uh, in St James's Hospital in Leeds, uh, again, you can see some of the numbers that they generate from their theatres uh, through the, the harmonic scalpel uh, repurposing. Uh, this the numbers here again were, were very impacted by COVID, but 
um, and they only started halfway through last year. But again, I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavour of, of what's possible. So in terms of context, again, I'm sure I don't need to to uh, to, to burden this point too much. Um, obviously, uh, like all healthcare institutions around around the world, the, the NHS does a lot of incredible work. Um, but like with all walks of life, there is a, there are byproducts to that which aren't quite so positive. And obviously, the two mentioned here are 590,000 tonnes of waste per annum, which is more than some some countries, and 5.4% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than aviation and shipping combined. I'm led to believe. Um, so um, obviously, as uh, you almost feel duty bound, particularly on hot days like today, we've got to be doing more about this. Um, but uh, and, and there's a lot of work going on uh, in, in exactly that 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 fashion, uh, and in no small part because obviously the link between the environment and climate and people's health is becoming ever more profound as well. So we really are duty bound to do something about it. Um, and, and entities such as uh, obviously the HSN, but also and NHS England, who you've heard from earlier today from Rebecca, but also people such as the Centre of Sustainable Healthcare in Oxford uh, are doing some great work in trying to address these issues. Um, and you can see on your screen, hopefully, it may be a bit small, but the, uh, they've drawn up four principles uh, of how to uh, attack some of these some of these issues. Uh, remanufacturing comes into, into principle number four, which is if you have a patient in, uh, in, in a hospital and you have to perform a procedure, how do you do that uh, by uh, uh, minimising waste and minimising the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted? Um, remanufacturing or reprocessing uh, is the same nomenclature uh, in many ways. Um, is also uh, mentioned in the, in the 2020 uh, net zero paper, um, uh, and again, this uh, is, is an important uh, driver for us. So, what is it we do? Um, well, in essence, we take a uh, used medical device and we restore it to as new functional and safety standards with matching warranties. Um, we recommend there's a question I think about uh, uh, liability, etc. Yes, we become the manufacturer of the remanufactured device, and all liabilities warranties sit with us accordingly. So, let's take a harmonic scalpel for example. Uh, the, the new ones of these are made in Mexico uh, using valuable earthly resources. They are shipped to uh, through the distribution channels of hospitals around the world. In this case, obviously, a hospital in the UK is then used on a patient, sometimes only for a few minutes at a time. Uh, they cost four hundred pounds ish plus, uh, and then it's then thrown away uh, to be just uh, to, for, for Jason and his team and other and the other team, boys teams across the uh, the, the hospital network to, to deal with. So what we remanufacture says is, please don't throw that device away. Uh, the device then gets sent to our plant, where it gets an initial clean. Uh, we laser mark. Uh, that uh, that device. So we have information from the original product on that laser mark. We also have traceability on that laser mark, where it's come from and then where it's gone to and how many times it's come through our process. So, so that's a, an important uh, stage of the process. They then go off to get thoroughly cleaned, thoroughly decontaminated. Uh, they then get checked to the nth degree. To, uh, and Rebecca mentioned this, that yeah, we don't batch test, we test each and every single device to make sure uh, they perform as they should. Uh, they're then uh, packaged and then they're sterilized and are placed into a pool of CE marked, soon to be CA marked uh, products that any hospital in, uh, in, in Europe can purchase. Um, so obviously what this does is it extends the life cycle of these very good single use uh, uh, devices uh, and the CE marking obviously we have to prove that, uh, that, they, that the devices are capable of, of withstanding the process. For a harmonic scalpel it's uh, two turns. So this has a degree of circularity to this very linear consum consumptive process, perhaps a reuse uh, 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 economy is perhaps more applicable than the circular economy, but it's certainly adding those principles of, of reuse, which is which is obviously vitally important, uh, which is helping to conserve the planet's valuable resources while keeping costs low uh, with no compromise on, on safety or performance. Uh, so just a little bit more on the benefits there. Well, you know, if you use a remanufactured device, it's about, they're there about half the price of a new one. We've talked about payment for collections, um, albeit what we do is a uh, you know real drop in the ocean in comparison to the 590,000 tonnes of uh, waste that's produced. It's a step in the right direction, I suppose, and there are some inherent waste savings there, but there's a very small amount. Um, and obviously what we do does provide some supply chain resiliency, albeit if there's a significant supply issue from an original device, uh, we will run out eventually too. But it provides that buffer uh, that hopefully can hit, help keep services going um, if there's a real problem with that. Um, on the environmental side of things, uh, again, obviously, it's helping to, to reduce the amounts that sent off to landfill and, in, and incineration. Uh, our, our life cycle analysis cites a 28.8% reduction in abiotic resource use by using remanufactured versus versus new. So obviously, saving that demand for, for valuable raw materials. Um, and the 50.4% uh, reduction per device, again, is, is very well, well documented. So the 
benefits are quite clear. But the third point on this um, on this screen is, is vitally important, um, and that is that this has to be encapsulated and encompassed with quality. In the hands of a physician, they need to know that a remanufactured device is clean, is sterile, and it works exactly the same way as a predicate device. And that's what all of our processes and that of our auditors are all geared to, to ensure we safely deliver. Um, maybe fairly new to you, um, but it's uh, common. This is remanufacturing as, as we do it. It's common practice uh, around in other parts of the globe. If you go to the US or Germany, they've been doing this for over 20 years. Uh, it's been fully regulated for, for 17 and other geographies such as Israel, Canada, Japan, etc. are rapidly, rapidly catching up. Vanguard is a company. We're a German company. Um, so we're tapping in to obviously the expertise and infrastructure uh, of our colleagues in, in, in Berlin and, and other parts of Germany. Um, uh, we're the leading EU provider. We have over a thousand customers, um, including universities and teaching hospitals. Uh, this number goes up every day, but 2.5 million devices um, have been safely remanufactured and gone on to be reused. Uh, and all the main German GPOs uh, purchase, purchase uh, our devices. And we're rapidly expanding into other, other parts of, uh, of Europe as the regulations allow. Uh, in terms of the UK, the MHRA produced guidelines in 2016, which was really the catalyst for remanufacturing starting, starting here and provided us with the, uh, I guess, the, the regulatory framework from which we we're able to, to, to carry on. Um, until the point we now have obviously 59 uh, UK officers on board with, with more on the way. Um, if you'd like to know uh, a lot more about what we do, the AMDR is, is our trade association um, and, and they have a, a great website full of uh, very useful uh, information. They, they, they do a lot of uh, obviously data collection, uh, a lot of case study uh, uh, assistance, and they also do a lot, of, a, good, a lot of good work promoting remanufacturing globally. So if you want to know more, they're a really good place to go to. Um, probably need to update this slide, but you can see that one of the numbers in the right hand speech bubble there is, is what remanufacturing saved healthcare institutions globally uh, in 2019. It's obviously half a, half a billion dollars, which was born from 15 million pounds, which I think is seven and a half thousand tons or so of waste uh, that would have gone on to be the, you know, to landfill or incineration. Um, which saved a further $21 uh, million dollars in onward waste disposal costs. So there's some huge numbers here in terms of what, what remanufacturing uh, uh, as an innovator can deliver in terms of reducing waste. Um, so our goal is obviously to proportionally replicate these numbers in, uh, in the markets that we operate. A uh, little bit more on the little bit more on the on the process here. Um, obviously, you know, I've, I've sort of talked through uh, to some, some some elements of this already, but you can see on your screen the picture of a harmonic scalpel. You know, we we're we have to have a very specialist expertise and machinery enabled to be able to clean and, and decontaminate these, these devices properly. Uh, we have to take them apart uh, for, for a start. Um, these devices are, are expensive, they're electronic um, and uh, yeah, are, are fairly technically challenging. Um, but uh, obviously the process is incredibly thorough to ensure that they are they are clean and sterile and, and, and work as, as, as they should. And in fact, the material and the electrical integrity testing that we have to do uh, is, is multifold uh, to ensure that our device is, is working exactly as, as, as it should do. Um, and then obviously the pack from a packaging and, and sterilization perspective, that will have to be as per industry standards. And indeed, indeed for us to get a CE mark, we have to meet the same requirements uh, from MDD, MDR, uh, compliance um, uh, uh, reasoning uh, as a new new device coming into the market. So uh, again, the processes are, are incredibly thorough. And there's more on that on this oh, just, yeah, on this screen here, which I won't go into too much. Just in terms of how we uh, check the microbiology, uh, the volumetric, and obviously the standardised testing of uh, of each to each to each device. Um, if anyone would like to know more about that, then uh, we'll, we'll we'll happily share. In terms of a regulatory perspective, already mentioned the MHRA guidelines. Um, BSI is, is one of our notified bodies. Obviously, we have to provide, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the CMART devices into market with 13485 and DD9MDR um, compliant. Um, and in fact, that top point there is quite interesting. Uh, the term single use, which is the circle with the two and a line through it, is, uh, is only applied by the original manufacturers. Uh, the devices that we're collecting, which in the main are EP catheters and harmonic scalpels, um, used to be uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, reprocessed on site and reused. And in fact, if you go to other parts of the world, uh, that that does happen. So these devices are robust; they're able to to do it. But because we've got that single use uh, market on there, obviously they they need to be uh, dealt with in the correct correct fashion. So that's what we do: is deal with them in in the in the correct fashion. Um, but this is the tide that uh, we're we're sort of swimming against: is the fact that you know these these devices have been and and clinical teams have been told for the last thirty years or so that single use is the way forwards. Um, so part of the behavioural change and just part of the, uh, I guess, educational piece is just to persuade people that there is another way. 
Um, and, th and luckily, people are being persuaded, which is uh, which is good. Um, and the use of remanufactured devices around the world is, is increasing, as is the body of supporting literature that cites that they are working in the clinician's hands as they should do. And there's a recent paper here from uh, St George Hospital in London, uh, citing, and you probably certainly won't be able to read that, but it cites that they were safe, efficient and reliable uh, when they used uh, remanufactured devices. And that's all the plaudits that we need. Uh, we also get a mention in the recent webinar series, uh, 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 which have been produced by the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, they had a, a series of, of sustainability and surgery, and we got mentioned as a, a suite of solutions for theatre suites looking to reduce their impacts. But again, it's great to have that support. Um, the portfolio, as I mentioned, it's it's sort of driven towards EP catheters in the main as they're very expensive single use devices, but we have surgical now, harmonics and there are other lines coming. Uh, also on the continent, we do all some orthopedic and endoscopy devices as well. Uh, there's more of that hopefully coming into the UK, UK sh shortly. Um, and we've got 289 products CE marked as I talk to you today. And obviously that's important because the more products that we are able to get through our R&D and be able to provide as a remanufactured um, uh, offering to hospital means that the overlap between what hospital uses and what we can provide is bigger, which means that the uh, the savings and the environmental gains can be bigger as well. And as part of the setup program, we will do an opportunity assessment uh, with each individual hospital to say, okay, what, what is it we think we can deliver? And that gives us something to, to work towards. Um, what's even better is when those savings or the money that you're in, uh, generating can be reinvested into your own sustainability drive. That's really helps with that, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, to propel the program forwards in the clinical areas, which is good. Uh, touch on collections really quickly. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, we, we can set up an account pretty quick, uh, but it's important that we go through all the right steps and just make sure all the key stakeholders are involved and everybody's happy with, with what we do. Uh, we establish the account, uh, provide all the collection materials free of charge, bit of training. Uh, the process at the end of the case is very simple. Um, and then, uh, we provide ongoing support in that, that regard as, uh, as as we go. Uh, we pay between two to fifty pounds per device, and then each quarter we produce a report, um, which uh, which will help sort of obviously help with the uh, with, with with all the metrics feeding into into hospitals green plans and your own sustainability sustainability drives. And there's a little bit more on the process here, but basically this this process just makes it's, it's step by step. We support the hospital right, right throughout the process, um, and it basically uh, you know just makes sure that everybody's involved and everybody's happy. Um, if you get to when you get to reuse again, the key group that we need to bring in there are the clinicians, and uh, and obviously make sure that they're happy and all governance questions uh, are answered. So um, again, conscious I've been talking for a little bit, but just to to leave you with a snapshot, these are some of the things that we delivered in in, in calendar 21 uh, across the, across the UK. At the time we had 55, we're now up to 59, and there's more coming. So we really hope that we're going to add some more more to these numbers uh, uh, as a collective. Um, so I hope that meets the objective, original objective, giving you a bit of an insight in terms of what we do. Um, and perhaps you to have a little think about uh, if there's something of interest that, to you that when to bring that into your own hospital. Um, and yeah, if I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause very briefly on this slide. Feel free to take a snapshot or a snip of that, of my details. Um, I'd happily answer any, uh, any, any questions that anybody may have. Um, and I'm sure Kathy and the team here have got my details as well, which are, you know, feel free to, to pass those on. Um, so I'm just gonna pause there for one second and then, um, James obviously couldn't be with us today, so I was really hoping that not only would I just talk to you a bit about Leeds, but I'd also talk to you, uh, he'd talk to you firsthand of his uh, his experience from uh, from North, North Norwich, which is obviously an, another one of uh, the Vanguard customers. Um, so uh, again, his his opportunity was uh, was driven around um, uh, electrophysiology, and uh, so if you have a cath lab, there's definitely a big opportunity. And he had 20 operating theatres in uh, the Norfolk Norwich uh, University Hospitals Trust. Uh, they're one of the biggest electro electrophysi electrophysiology centres uh, across across the UK. Um, some of his challenges, Jason's laid mentioned some of this. Um, just in terms of challenging uh, around some of the waste, lack of space. Um, there's a real estate in a sluice, um, which uh, which is obviously at a premium. Uh, our boxes are 60 by, by, by 40 by 20, but you still got to squeeze them in there somewhere. So we obviously had to work that a little bit. Uh, there's a change, even though the, process, the collection process is easy, it's, it's still a change. Um, and this is why the training uh, of the staff is really important. Uh, but he had to approach this with all, all of the uh, the clinical staff accordingly. Uh, and obviously during COVID and, and generally, you, know, you need to make sure that the, the site visitor access is limited from a, a, a prevention, a infection prevention perspective. Uh, again, we have to make sure that we work around all of those controls uh, carefully. Uh, supplier rivalry, well, I think what he's talking about there is, is everybody likes what we do uh, generally. Um, but uh, the, the one group that's not quite so enamoured of the original manufacturers, uh, they feel that we're a bit of a threat to their revenue streams. 
Um, albeit, I think uh, increasingly they accept that we are part of the ecosystem supply um, and that there has to be, if this is the future direction of travel, uh, and maybe that that word graciously will come into that, that sentence um, and they'll start working with us a little bit more to perhaps make some more of their devices uh, reusable. That would That's uh, the dream. Um, so hopefully that's that's where that that will go. Um, consultant appetite again. This is something which is a is always uh, so a challenge. We tend to find groups. <laughs> excuse me. Our consultants are really keen. Those who are not really worried, and those who who aren't. And and a lot of this comes from again thirty years of being told that single use is the uh, is the way forward. And obviously our devices are fully available by the frameworks. Uh, but we have to make sure we comply with the regulations. <laughs> excuse me. Um, so this is their journey. Need to crack on, Paul. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is their journey, and uh, and as you can see, that they've progressed through uh, all the different stages, uh, held up by COVID, uh, but hopefully, uh, hopefully, moving forwards now uh, uh, and really expanding the program <coughs> to deliver more uh, successes. There you go. You've seen some of that, um, and uh, yeah, they, they really did a great job. Um, <coughs> which I've not done a great uh, great job of, of, I guess, communicating. Um, but if I'm sure James won't mind if you want to contact him and talk about that a little bit more. Next steps is, uh, as mentioned, to expand the uh, expand the process. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So we've we've had loads of questions, some of which have been answered in the um, in the, the the chat itself. So apologies if I um, if I ask one that has already been done but I thought that the, the one of the, the interesting things that was coming out from this was around behaviour change so Pete Waddingham asked a question about um, how confident are we and this was for James uh, or around James's presentation how confident are we or the NHS that the colour-coded bags are used appropriately? Uh, that really is in the is in the hands of each trust that audits their own waste streams, and they they, they should be checking their waste streams. I I would say that I am ninety, probably between ninety five and ninety seven percent confident. But we do uncover things all of the time when we audit that are not quite the way that they should be. But the but the whole point of auditing and and going through your ward processes is to make sure that wards are behaving and acting in the way that they 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 should be. Um, you know, but I mean, we, we have something like 200 wards and departments to audit. I, I couldn't physically do that in a year. So, you know, we, we're on a three yearly rolling program. Um, so it's not like we're constantly looking inside every ward's bins, but we, you know, we do our best. It, it, the reason that I flagged this is because, um, I, you know, I struggle to get my wider family to put the right stuff in the right bin at the right time in the right way. So how can how can we how can we do that and this isn't necessarily a question for jane for jason i think it's a question for everyone how do we um engender that behavior change that means that we can make it easy for people to do the right thing and people do the right thing every time i don't know whether anybody has got any answers so they can put them in the chat if they have because i would be delighted if there was a, a trust out there that had cracked this because i know when i go around and speak to waste management people procurement people and, and states this is one of the biggest issues is around behavior um we have uh, paul yes paul taylor has ideas around the topic would be great to hear about them paul if you want to my, my um email is in the chat or you can contact me or pete and we would love to be able to help and hear what you've got um, so some terminology questions around um, needing to change the terminology. We should talk about recycling and waste, not waste management. We could talk about reuse, recycling and waste and, and a comment that the language reduction should on, on language reducing should be a, a key bit. And Alex uh, Pittman mentioned that our glove budget is similar to our waste budget. Redu money from reduction is the real price. Do you agree with that? Uh, I do. I just we, we we need to temper it slightly because first and foremost, uh, we're we're in the role of waste managers, and the safe uh, uh, and compliant management of waste is comes above everything else. Um, and because we 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 can't have incidents or accidents with the waste that we that we're we're handling. Um, but I do agree that uh, you know re recycling. I I my background is you know, prior to NHS. I worked for IKEA, and we were really big on our recycling. We pushed it really hard. Um, it's harder to do that in a healthcare setting, but also the market conditions have changed dramatically, really, in the time that I've been with the NHS. Uh, and it's it's harder to get materials to be accepted by waste companies, and they have moved they have moved significantly away 
from from the materials that they'll accept. Literally, they will only take now the legislated materials, tins, cans, pop bottles, paper cards. That's about it. Um, whereas previously soft plastics and pots and tubs and trays and all of that kind of stuff would, would be accepted. So it's, it's a real challenge. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I, I agree. We you know we we should be talking about this, uh, you know, move a move away from from talking about waste as rubbish, but as more as a, you know, it's a resource. Yeah, Paul has made the point that when you get to fifty one percent recycling, you're not a waste manager anymore. I think it's valid. Um, and Sarah from Frimley Health, sorry, Sarah Taylor from Frimley Hill NHS Foundation Trust, um, we're, we're, are going to request that waste management and recycling become the mandatory training included in the mandatory training, which I think is a fab idea. Absolutely um, agree. And I know waste managers on the NPAG group all feel exactly the same. And we, we've lobbied NHS, uh, E and I, the estates and facilities guys there uh, to, to to see what they can do to get it on, because we, we we absolutely agree that it's really important. Yeah, thank you. Um, a question for, for, for Jason and Paul, because Rebecca, you answered all of your questions in the chat, which means that it was it was look like I'm I'm completely ignoring you I promise I'm not and do do come in um so so the uh, Paul Taylor commented on on your presentation Jason that all the innovation seems to have been driven by NHS staff and asked how much innovation has come from your re recycling and waste service supplier and I guess that's a, a wider question about where does the innovation come from is it is it internal is it external and and then it links to the point that um, somebody made in the chat earlier about how do you get the economies of scale if you're a smaller provider? I, I can answer really quickly actually. I would say on the non-healthcare waste, the domestic waste if you like, there, there's been no innovation within that industry and anything about segregation uh, and recycling is driven by us as staff. On the clinical healthcare waste side of things, uh, we work very closely with SharpSmart. SharpSmart take our, bulky, our bulk healthcare waste as well as our reusable sharps, an extremely proactive company and work really closely with us. But when we tendered, um, that Rebecca was talking about the 10% of the tender being on social value and carbon. Our tender last year with, with a number of trusts in the tiny Weir region was 20% and it was it included innovation and it included waste hierarchy uh, movements as well. And Sharpsmart absolutely blew everybody away because they, they, they were very proactive and they came in with a very strong uh, submission and they followed through on that and they are working on that. So, yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Um, Stuart Faulkner has asked uh, Paul whether the process that you talked about requires a re-review of the CE mark by notified authorities or regulators. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I've, uh, I, and you probably noticed I was struggling yeah. a little bit. I did. I did test positive yesterday, and I'm battling on. So please, apologies, apologies for losing uh, losing my flow towards the end there. I, th I did. I thought I was doing quite well. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so the, so the, yes, the, C, the CE the CE mark is is based on our ability to uh to to uh, uh, uh to create the device that works in the same way as the uh as the original device um and that all the material characteristics therein uh uh, uh meet the, the required standards so yeah our c mark is completely it's a different thing to uh the new device c mark albeit we have to meet some of the same requirements such as uh you know making sure the devices are working uh, in the clinical setting as they should um so i hope that answers your question again Without, I can refer it on to some of uh, my R and D people if you'd like to know anything more technical than that. Thank you. And you mentioned fifty percent savings and then fifty percent carbon reductions. So mm. Sarah Walpole is from Nice is interested in. And when you say savings, do you mean financial savings? Yes. So the fifty percent savings again. <clears throat> This is this is an estimation because it does depend on what the the, uh, the hospital is paying for their original devices, um, but uh, the uh, uh, the pricing of a remanufactured device is there or thereabouts half the price of a of a new device. Now, obviously, when we go to a hospital, we do we sort of they see our pricing as part of the opportunity assessment. They have to work out how that fits with their existing contractual arrangements with with the original manufacturers, etc., and they can actually come to a, a an exacting number, uh, but it's it's in and around that region. Um, and then the 50.4% reduction in uh, greenhouse gases, that's based on our life cycle analysis, which was uh, produced by the Fraunhofer Institute uh, over in Germany. Thank you. Um, ooh, sorry, I've just lost the question that I was looking at, so I'll, I'll go back to my list. Um, Stuart Faulkner has asked about the, the remanufacturing approach. How does this balance with the original device manufacturer's business approach at maximising profits? They they sell fewer products as you remanufacture them. And you talked a bit about this in when you when you covered off um, James's slides as, as one of the barriers. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> so as I've said, yeah, they we are. Do you know what? We're such a drop in the ocean in comparison to what you know you're spending with these these big companies. Um, but uh, so they shouldn't really be worried too worried about us. I think they're doing quite perfectly okay uh, as it is. But uh, yes, we we are seen as and in and in more mature markets such as the US. I mean, there are we're the only company doing this in the UK. But in the US, there's seven reasonably sized companies who are doing this in certain uh, single use uh, device fields. Um, and it's a good, it's a healthy competition for the OEMs. You know, there's a, there's a reduction in price. There's a there's a better resource use uh, that, you know, we, we really hope as an industry uh, globally that it encourages better, you know, better practices. Um, but uh, yeah, they will. Uh, but And interestingly, some of the big original manufacturers uh, in the US actually do this themselves to compete. So as we as we sort of grow and and mature, you know, maybe that'll come into uh, in, in into play here as well. Um, but you know, they, they, I know there's a lot of good things going on in amongst the region, the region manufacturing trying to be more sustainable. Uh, but we think that we can help accelerate that. Thank you, Rebecca. I just thought I'd come in from a, an NHS perspective on that. So I uh, definitely uh, agree with what Paul was saying. Um, but also, I guess what what we are advising trust where, for example, you have certain contract volumes um, or contracts in place that are uh, subscribing you to either a certain uh, number of devices or a certain volume of devices. It's looking for where there's low hanging fruit in that contract. So say you wanted to try something like this to buy a remanufactured device. OK, you might have 70 percent of your contract volume is with uh, an original equipment manufacturer. So we wouldn't be asking you to kind of disrupt that contract and cause problems between you and your, your OEM. But what you might be wanting to look at in the first instance is that 30% that um, that maybe isn't, you know, subscribed to a specific, spe sorry, specific manufacturer. And that's where you can look at um, maybe starting to kind of trial some device, remanufacture devices um, uh, and then obviously take it from there. So that's what we advise is I think sometimes people worry to say if we're asking for device remanufacturing, we're asking people to go 100% straight away and, and and that's not the case. We appreciate that you have kind of supplier customer relationships that you also need to maintain and manage with your with your original equipment suppliers. Thank you. Bethan Davis, um, University Hospital Sussex, has asked about uh, she said there seems to, there seems there are options to repurpose, reuse very technical pieces of equipment like electrophysiology devices, but she hasn't seen a similar service available for less technical devices. So, for example, urinary catheters and enteral feeding systems, NG tubes. Is anybody aware of a service available for these less technical items? So I don't know if Paul is going to say anything on this. I guess there's there is still an emerging field, reusable uh, reprocessing. We know there are uh, different other products out there. So, for example, um, there's been lots of work uh, looking at, I think, like laryngoscopes or also um, and also the trocarts. And there's certain companies that do reprocessing of them, but it's still a really new and emerging field um, in this country. And so when we develop our how to guides, what we're often looking for is where there is maybe some example of practice mm. or emerging or good practice, because um, I guess, you know, we want to do that innovation piece, but actually we also need to to give the NHS something that they can see has been tested some way. I guess, you know, we're dealing with uh, quite often these are clinical medical products, and so we need to be able to provide some sort of assurance and confidence. And I think a lot of the time the academic papers and the case studies are still really emerging in this field. So that's a bit of a waffly answer to say there are more products becoming available and more companies innovating all the time. Um, um, but we don't have this giant list of of, um, of of different devices that can be can be remanufactured yet. We're we're definitely still in the process of building that. And just can just I to add to that, Kathy, uh, a lot of the products that you mentioned there are PVC, uh, and we did we we participated in the PVC capturing scheme that that started about five or six years ago. Uh, it was suspended because of COVID, uh, and then and then after COVID finished, the company that were that were running that scheme just abandoned it and and uh, decided that it wasn't it wasn't worthwhile following through. But that was we did capture lines. We also captured masks, you know, oxygen masks and all of that kind of stuff in there. But it um, it, it, it pr presumably just wasn't viable. Uh, but it is a problem because PVC through incineration or through heat treatment processes is not great either. So. Hmm. Thank you. Just just to add one other point to that is uh, please feel free to pick the phone up to the MHRA and ask them to uh, to spread the uh, the regulatory uh, boundaries to an allow class one devices to be remanufactured. That would be a great help. Thank you. There was something in my head there and predictably it's gone. Oh, yeah, that was it. Is it. Rebecca, you might know this. Uh, 
if if these schemes aren't viable for um for companies to deliver around the PVC recycling reuse and so on, is there any intention at a um, a national level to incentivise something like this? I mean that's that's a good question. I maybe can't give a, a direct answer to that because I think it depends on the project and the demand side. So I think where maybe we've fallen into traps before. Maybe I don't know if that's one of the the reasons that the PVC um, products trials was an issue before COVID is that where there's not the demand, it doesn't really give a company an incentive to kind of keep developing developing and innovating that product. So I think that's what we've been trying to do with our operational interventions work is to build up that demand side. So you know, for example, you know, Vanguard is is one of the um, uh, it's a remanufacturer in the UK market, the only one at the moment. Our goal would be actually that there's probably more con competition than that uh, further down the line. Um, but actually, we need to make sure that the demand is coming from the NHS to get other companies to enter the market. And, and obviously, we're just not there yet. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I don't know is the answer in terms about the incentivization, but I think the first place is having the demand um, for for these products um, because, yeah, I guess we it's kind of a bit of a chicken and egg situation. We wouldn't incentivize something that there's not a demand for, but we also need to create that demand um, so that the supply side will actually start making these products and selling them to us. I don't yes, know if that helps, you. but. Well, Sarah Walpole from NICE has, has just put in the chat that MHRA have consulted on the point that, that you made, Paul, and decided not to allow class one items remanufacturer despite responses. Does anybody have any idea why? <clears throat> it's to do with the post-market surveillance. Um, <clears throat> so obviously we have to be able to prove that the devices are working A-OK, -okay, uh, et cetera, and class one devices don't have quite the same uh, follow-up is, is my understanding. Um, but there are, and, and this is a big part of the business in the US and other markets, is the is the cheaper single use things, things like pulse oximeters and cuffs, which is crazy that they can't be reused. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, maybe something that we'll keep working on. Thank you. And what about, Stephen Turk has asked, what about medical devices manufactured in a textile used in, um, in the NHS? Can they be remanufactured? Uh, so if it's a, again, under the MHRA guidelines, if it falls into one of those uh, categories that can, uh, then uh, I mean, there's, there's no limit really to what you can do. But in, in terms of, you know, physically, uh, the, the limits come in terms of the amount of R&D and investment you have to put in to be able to get the process validated, that it's safe. Uh, then to get them CE marked, it's a big investment in in time and money uh, to get these uh, these products into market. So yeah, if the market's there, if it's if it's you're able to do it regulated from regulatory perspective, if you can physically do it, and there's the the appetite there from the market, then uh, yeah, anything's possible. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions I think for for Jason again um, from Gareth Carnes. So firstly, is EFW really circular? It's it's not just value from waste because once it's burnt, it's left the circle. Uh, I could be tempted to agree with that, yes. But I, but I, I, as I've said in the chat, it's uh, it's a better option than uh, than clinical waste disposal, where the purpose literally is to put it into an incinerator and destroy it. Um, and that's currently where we are with with some of our waste streams. So it's not it's not ideal by any stretch. But the next stage of the work that I do, I would say, is to get that uh, that that energy from waste bulge in the middle and reduce that significantly and move waste up through. But it's not easy given the market conditions that are out there at the moment and the move for, of the big companies away from, you know, recycling and innovation in, in, in those areas. So we've got to work on just on, on reduction, really prevention and minimization and actually that we're sending less to these companies in the first place. Thank you. And, and Sarah Warpole has asked whether you know how emissions from the energy required to reprocess sharps compares with the emissions associated with innovation. Uh, I, did Sarah say we could have this conversation outside of this? Because oh, I she may, she may well have done. Answer. Yes, yeah. I sort of, yeah. sort of lost track. There's so much going on in the chat. <laughs> Fantastic. And then um, case studies of of around reporting greenhouse gases for scope three. Um, so the process needs some work. It'd be good to see case studies of this done well in the NHS. I just wondered whether anyone knows of any, and and if they could do, could they please put it in the chat? Um, have I missed any questions that haven't been answered in the chat that people are burning to, to ask? Um, I know that Maria asked a, a, a question about lateral flow tests and do they remain non, re, remain non recyclable? Uh, the, my understanding is they, they couldn't be recycled because there'll be some kind of uh, chemical within them 
uh, and the recy recyclers certainly wouldn't touch them, certainly wouldn't. Thank you. And and I, I think there is a Mexican company who was making recyclable LFTs uh, or biodegradable LFTs. I can't remember which. The Welsh governments were looking into using them. Um, have patients been consulted on remanufactured devices? So from uh, looking at medical devices, so uh, for the remanufactured devices piece of work, um, no is the short answer, um, mainly, I guess, because um, the device remanufacturing that we've been looking at, so, you know, the catheters, the uh, the harmonic scalpels, I guess it doesn't have an impact on patient care, but obviously I'll welcome challenge on that. Um, but that being said, on the walking aid side, we've done a lot of consultation and engagement with um, service user groups. So we are linked into the National Strategic Co-Production Group that is linked to the Personalised Care Programme, uh, NHS England, um, and uh, any kind of materials that we've been developing. So things like uh, posters, but also surveys for patients or anything that's public facing, that group is full of people with lived experience um, and they've had a really big impact, you know, from so, for example, one of our walking aids posters had um, a recycling bin on it with walking aids and they all didn't like that. They thought that just looks like it's going into a waste stream. We need more positive imagery. Um, and so we we made changes to that. So we we tend to go to that group quite regularly whenever we've got anything, um, particularly, you know, that, you know, we're asking, you know, patients and service users to bring back their walking aids. So um, we're asking them to take action. So that's why we've been trying to consult with them a little bit more than we have done on the device from manufacturing side. Thank you. And just to add, just to add a touch to that, you know, our, our process is geared as is that of our auditors to ensure the device is clean, it's safe, and it works exactly the same as a predicate device. And that's what our CMR is based on. Um, it's uh, they're not consulted when you use a reusable tray of instruments each and every each and every time. Um, so uh, no, yeah, no the answer to that. Thank you. And and, but also, Cathy, sorry, hmm. I was going to just say quickly, if Jackie thinks actually there is a gap and there's something that we've missed on that side of things and they could add some value, you know, please, please do get in touch and definitely open to, to doing more patient engagement where yes, it's kind really. of, you know, relevant and appropriate. Lovely. Thank you. Um, Alex Pittman, sorry that I missed your, your question earlier. You asked a, a question about how much single use do, do trusts equipment to trust buy and is there an easy way to report that? And that was for Rebecca. So Alex, um, Annie, could you um, unmute Alex and ask her to, uh, and Alex, could you um, just ask your question? Because I don't think I've represented that very well. So I think I can see Alex's question if Alex isn't unmuted. So it, in terms of single use, you're probably going to be having to look at, I guess, in individual product levels. I think the only way that we can get that data at the moment is by looking at the spend comparison service data. So when you're looking at, I guess, through your procurement systems, how much you're buying and, and the volumes and what you're buying. And like, for example, um, I sit on uh, as, as, as one of the members of the Black Country ICS um, uh, kind of greener uh, clinical procurement group. Um, and that's what they've been doing is looking at their spend data because we don't obviously have comprehensive carbon footprinting data at like a product level for all products yet. Um, your your spend data is probably going to be the closest thing that you can you can find that out locally. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking it would be useful for us to know if fifty percent of the stuff we buy is single use now. It, so in general, like in across all product and categories. Yeah, and, and then as as a as a target, we should be driving that down, and then it will we'll have less waste if we buy less single use stuff. So I was just you know, as a high level target, it would it might help us do some smart stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. It's probably a challenge considering, I guess, you know, to be frank, there's I think it's what's the quote that there's more products on the NHS supply chain catalog than there is uh, on Amazon, for example. Um, we've definitely tried, Alex, to do some rationalisation of the products that are on the catalog. So obviously we aren't, so NHS supply chain are a separate organisation, but we have tried to work with them to say, you know, actually, when you've got 10 of this item or actually you've got lots of virgin paper on the catalog, is there a way to to reduce that so actually people have got less access to different kinds of you know non-green products um but i'm waffling with my answer now but i think we do have that for for some things like we'll we'll definitely be developing some of that for catering plastics because we're going to be developing a how-to guide um but we're probably not at the point yet where like at the center we've got that for all single use um items but definitely something i can take away and, and ask my analysts about they'll know better than me 
Thank you. And then Helen um, has been asking about any, if anyone in the, the wider group has uh, looked into pharmaceutical recycling, like used inhalers and insulin plastics. Um, and yes, the black hole. So uh, Helen, you might be interested in our previous learning and sharing event around reducing the impact of um, uh, asthma inhalers on the environment, where there was a lot of chat about the the, the inhaler recycling scheme or, or absence of, of one. Um, and Sarah Taylor has come back to you on the fact that they've done some work in um, Frimley around this. Sarah, I'd also be interested in hearing about that. Um, could we just go to the final slide, please, Annie? So I just, in, in while that's coming up, I just wanted to say a huge thank you, firstly, to all of our speakers today uh, for, for some really interesting and thought provoking presentations. Thank you. Um, thank you as well to Annie, Alex, Amanda and Rox for setting all of this up and doing all the work, uh, which we really appreciate. Um, there, there will be uh, slides and recording made to available everyone after the event. We'll also try and summarise some of the ideas as someone has asked in the chat. Uh, we run these events quarterly. Uh, future events are always based around what you would like to see, what people in the NHS the, would like to, to have the conversations about. So if you have ideas, please do send them in to us because that way we can make sure that they, they continue to be relevant to you. Uh, on, on the list are sustainable procurements and environmental sustainability in, in wound care. But as I say, if there's something that you would feel would be useful, um, please do let us know. And, and then final thank you. Thank you so much for all the, the, the generosity and the questions in the chat. It's been, as I said at the start, this is where the real value is. Um, so make the connections and keep on, on talking. And if there's something that you think the AHSN network can do, please do reach out and let me know. Have a great day. Stay cool. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>